All right, welcome back to The Code. Again, this is Dr. Andrew Fix, your host of this uh, podcast with Physio Room, a physical therapist. Our practice is here in the Denver area. And today I'm really excited. We've got one of our clients here coming on the show. His name is Gabe Martinez, and um, I'll let him give a little background for you guys. But he's joining our show. He's a Leadville Race Series competitor, specifically five-time Leadville 100 uh, run finisher and two-time Leadman series finisher. So Gabe, welcome to The Code. Thanks for being on here. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Excited to be here. Absolutely. And you know, you've been a, a client of ours for a little while, um, so I've gotten to know you a little bit. But for the people that are tuning into this episode, we just give them like, you know, a brief background of yourself, um, you know, where you're from, what types of things you enjoy doing. And um, yeah, just just give a little background of yourself. Yeah. Um, my name is Gabe. I'm originally from Colorado, grew up here, you know, went to the Colorado School of Mines for college, moved to Texas for a while for work, came back for grad school, um, and been here the majority of the time. Um, usually end up, usually I'm outside doing something active, trail running, mountain biking, snowboarding, or uh, things of that nature. Yeah. And just like you said, like you're a pretty active person. Um, from what it sounds like to me, uh, you wrestled in college, right? Yes. Is that right? So yeah, I remember that was one thing that we kind of connected on is I think the very first time that I met you, you had like a wrestling, it was either a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or something on. And, um, but one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on the show was because of this, um, the ultra race experience that you have. Um, and you guys <laughs> gave is like an inspiration to me because he has completed numerous time events that, um, you know, I could only dream of doing it at this point. I've never thought about com completing one of these like ultra distance races. Um, but when I see Gabe training and putting in the work, it like makes me want to kind of do the same thing. But um, so Gabe, you're from Leadville, yes, sir. right? Where the races take place. Um, were, were those, was the race series up there in Leadville something that you like got exposed to growing up like I don't even know when when this series started or how long this has been going on but like when did you get exposed to it for the first time yeah my whole my whole life actually um so the Leadville 100 run is the second oldest in the in the country so it's been I think it was 85 was the first running of it so I mean I'm 30 years old so it's been going on longer than I've been alive so uh um yeah you you would see the whole town sort of shut down for these things for these events and so it was always it was always something that was on the radar and something that you knew was a big deal that was happening. And, you know, even as a kid, I was thought, Hey, someday it'd be <laughs> fun to try to do this. Yeah. Now, most people out here in Colorado, where we are, who are active outdoorsy people, um, particularly if you run or mountain bike, I feel like a lot of people are familiar with what the level 100 is, but maybe people listening to this, don't really understand what that race is. Will you just give like a, you know, quick snapshot of, of like, what is the Leadville 100 and what is the lead man series, lead woman series that um, these things that you've participated in? Yeah. So the Leadville 100 run is the last event and it's a hundred mile run through the mountains of Colorado. It starts at 10,000 feet, goes up to, I believe 12,500 and back down to 10,000. Um, you have 30 hours to reach the cutoff, um, to finish the, uh, the entire race. It's a, uh, so it's, it's an out and back course. So you'll be, you'll be on the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the run similar, I mean, sorry, the, the bike similar in that it's hundred miles out and back course, but you, I believe you have 12 hours to finish it. Um, okay. And then, and so those are, those are a week apart. So the, the mountain bike is mid-August and then a week later you'll have the 100 run um so the lead man series is it's five events through the course of the summer in which you do you start with a trail marathon in June um two to three weeks two or three weeks later you do a 50 mile run or a 50 mile bike um and then four weeks after that you'll do the 100 mountain bike race the following day you'll do a 10k run and then the following the following weekend you'll do the 100 mile run and so that's, that's what the lead man series is. Yeah. So basically, and I remember when you were telling me about this, uh, you know, when you told me you were training for it and this was going to be the, uh, second time that you did the whole series. Um, I was, I was a little bit blown away, but the part that like kind of shocked me the most was, you know, it's 26.2, then 50 miles and then 
a hundred miles, a 10 K and then another hundred miles. But those last three are within like eight days, right? It's like Saturday, you do the hundred mile mountain bike. The next day you get up and you run your 10 K. And then the following Saturday, you run the, over the, you know, 30 hours, you do your hundred mile run again. So that, that last like eight day stretch sounds pretty grueling to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how I describe it as well. I would say that's, uh, that's the tough part about the challenge. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like the two shorter ones, the, the marathon and the 50 miler are like training built into their, the series. I, I would say so. And I, I know I definitely treated them as, uh, just training, training races. Like I, I didn't really taper for either of them. They were really just like, Hey, this is part of the training block to, yeah. to get us to August. Yeah. And it's, it's probably a good idea that they do that. Not that the series is not an extremely difficult thing to do, but, um, you know, maybe if someone is planning to do, to do this series and they, they find themselves like at the 50 miler and they're just really, really having a hard time finding that they're undertrained or maybe their nutrition strategy isn't what they hoped it is. It, it either, you know, helps you work out some of the kinks along the way and get prepared for the longer distances or, you know, maybe if you're really listening to your body and you find out like, wow, I don't, I'm really not as quite as prepared as I need to be for this. Maybe in a month, I shouldn't try to, uh, to do a hundred miles on back-to-back -back weekends, um, depending on how those early races go. But, um, how old were you? You said you're 30 now, right? How old were you when you did your Leadville 100 run for the first time that you did? And, and how did you decide to do that in the first place? Like what made you want to sign up for it? Um, I was 21 the first time I, uh, I attempted it. Um, I say attempted it because I didn't finish. Um, and what made me do that was, um, a, I think a year before that, or maybe some, something, some, some pretty close to that. I, uh, I paced my brother-in-law for part of it. Um, oh, so you're on his crew. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I get to, so I got to actually be a part of a part of the experience rather than observing it. And uh, got to run with him, and I got to see how he how he handled it, and, and to see it, and that was the part where I was just like, okay, I definitely want to do this now, or try to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so then, okay, so you were 21, you did it. Um, it sounds like it didn't quite go how you had planned, um, but you've done the Leadville 100 run now five times, twice as part of the series, right? So 21 years old you know, when did you do it the second time? And as you continued to sign up for it, like when was that transition between doing the hundred mile run to then when you decided I'm going to sign up for the, for the whole series and give that a shot? Yeah, I think so for me, it was, um, each, each time there was a specific goal attached to what I was trying to accomplish. And, you know, after kind of achieving it, you, you, you readjust. So first it was like, okay, I just want to finish it. And I finished it. And then it was like, okay, I want to finish in sub 25 because at, at 25 hour, at the 20, the 25 hour cutoff, it's, um, you get a gold buckle and it's, you know, the size of a, a little plate that's, uh, yeah. rather, than the, rather than this little, uh, silver one. So, and, and, you know, only, I think 80, 80 people get the, get the gold buckle in sub 25. So that was really, you know, Hey, if I really be one of the better ones, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the goal. And then, I think once I realized that I could hit that 25 hours, that's when I was, that's when I figured I needed a new challenge. And yeah. part of that was, I don't have a mountain bike and I should learn how to mountain bike. And uh, what a better way to do that than sign up for under mile race. Yeah. Well, it sort of forces you to learn how to mountain bike because uh, you know, I have a mountain bike and being relatively new myself, to Colorado, uh, I would definitely would not call myself a mountain biker at this moment. But if I signed up for a hundred mile race, you better bet that I would be putting in a lot of hours on that mountain bike, uh, trying to get better and, and prepared for that. So, so yeah, I mean, if you sign up for that, it's going to make you prepare and make you train. Otherwise race day is going to be a rude awakening. Um, so how old were you when you did that first, um, lead man series? Ooh, uh, let's see, probably 26 27 uh -huh. and then i took a uh took a couple of year break just because i knew my body was a little beat up yeah i needed to kind of focus on other things and just mm -hmm. uh give myself some time to rebuild to build back into uh being in shape to do it again so and then yeah, yeah. the last time was last year mm -hmm. 2021 okay so yeah so like three four years apart there 
Um, and I'm, I want to circle back on, on something. Uh, and then I want to ask you about that, like letting your body recover, rebuilding the stuff you just alluded to, but from seeing you in, in the clinic and talking to you before, um, long before we decided to start this podcast, I think I remember you telling me that you were living in Houston when you decided to sign up for the race and you did like a very considerable amount of your training for this run while you were in Houston. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah. So the first year I did it, I, uh, I was living or the first two times I actually attempted it. The first time I didn't finish the second time I did, I was, uh, I was living in Houston. So, uh, yeah, not ideal training grounds for a hundred mile, uh, race in the mountains at 10,000 feet. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Houston's nowhere near 10,000 feet, uh, pretty close to sea level and yeah, no mountains there. So now were there times when you were living in Houston that you would like come home, visit family and try to get some training in on that terrain. Yeah. Um, but that was, I think I would come back for 4th of July weekend or something yeah. like that. So Few was, and far between. Yeah. So it was maybe once or twice at, at the most really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, all of it was done yeah, lit at sea level and roughly flat terrain. Yeah. Oof, that's tough. Um, I mean, one of the things that we see with uh, other clients that we work with and whatnot is like, from a training standpoint, one of the best things you can do if you're going to be running a race, um, no matter what distance, 100 miles or, or anything less, from like a body sustainability and injury perspective is you want at least a good portion, a little more than half of that training to be done in the same type of environment that you're going to be racing on. So what I mean by that is if you're going to train for a marathon, and that marathon is going to be run, say, in Chicago or New York or Boston, somewhere where it's on the pavement. You don't want all of your training for that race to take place on the trails or on the treadmill. You want to train on the same type of surface that you're going to run on, at least for a good portion of the time, because then your body is going to become acclimated to that and your joints and your tissues will become acclimated to that. So how was that when you, were you able to train on trails in Houston or were you mostly running on the road, the treadmill? And, and how was that when you got here for like for the event weekend and, um, you know, you're running at in altitude, you're running at uh, climbing, climbing, you know, over a thousand feet, descending and just running on the terrain that you were. How did your body respond to that? Uh, not, yeah, not, not well, I would say. Uh, the first the first time I actually ended up with like a stress fracture, mm. my foot, um, mile 45, finally missed the cutoff at 75 miles. Um, and I think really that was, you know, my body not being used to running on rocks yeah. and doing stuff like that. Whereas, um, the majority of my training, my training in Houston was running around a three mile dirt loop, yeah. um, you know, multiple times, but then, you know, I was, I was doing other things to get creative with it. Right. Like I was to get some vertical, I was running up and down parking garages or, um, you know, you get on the stair step or for a little bit to try to simulate some vertical gain. But then, but the other part with that too, is like, um, you, you get proficient at moving up, but you're not used to running down. So your, you know, quads aren't ready. So I was doing, yeah. that. so I'm back in the gym doing lifting a lot. I was doing a lot of lifting there to like, just try to blast, destroy my quads as much as possible. <laughs> and just doing, you know, stupid stuff, like, you know, kind of meathead stuff where we were doing like, hundred rep sets to just mm -hmm. <laughs> pre fatigue the legs and then, uh, then go run, then go run. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That was exactly it. Well, and I love what you said because, um, you use the term, like, you know, I was trying to get creative of, you know, I don't have access to the terrain that I'm going to be competing on or, you know, challenging myself on what can I do to try and simulate the demands of what I'm going to do. And I think a lot of people run into that obstacle in whatever they're trying to train for, you know, um, for whatever reason, maybe your family circumstance changes or your financial circumstance changes and you lose access to the gym or you move and you lose access to something, you know, sometimes you just got to make do with what you've got and, and get creative. And there are a lot of different ways that you can go about building fitness and strength and endurance. It doesn't necessarily require any particular piece of equipment um, or particular trail or anything like that. Of course, those things are helpful. Um, they're tools that you can have access to, but um, that's not going to make or break your ability to do it. So I think those ideas that you laid out there, like running up and down a parking garage, like that's a brilliant idea. I don't even know if I would have thought about that. That is, that is brilliant. So, cause where else in a sea level spot, are you going to find some hills? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're, yeah, you're 
few and far between. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so so what I want to ask you about now and have you sort of impart here uh, on the show is you've gone through this numerous times. The very first time that you attempted, you weren't able to complete it. In fact, you sustained an injury afterward or during it that you had to recover from. You know, what have you learned along the way of when you signed up for it the first time? So over the last nine years of like how to prepare your body and and just like how to recover. Like what have you learned about like taking care of your body over the last nine years being part of these events? Yeah. Um tough to say. I mean, I, <laughs> I have a, I have a tendency to do too much and recover too little has been, I've noticed has been my, has been my MO for the majority of my, the majority of that time. But I think, um, you know, the big thing was, you know, learning to take care of your body and, and by taking care of it, you know, making sure that it's prepared to under undergo that type of stress. So that's mm-hmm. like, you know, doing, doing the prehab, doing the lifting and not, not yeah. slacking on those sort of things and, um, getting in the proper nutrition. And even, and now last more recently, like trying to make sure I'm getting enough sleep because I think you know, yeah. we, we tend to glorify, like not sleeping enough and doing that, that sort of thing and like re- subsisting on as little sleep as possible or something. But, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to be more mindful of all of those things and how they, uh, impact me. Yeah, and I love that you said that, you know, we try to glorify, uh, at least here in the United States, I don't know if other countries do this, but we had an episode on this show um, early on called The Code to Sleep Hygiene. And that was, um, that episode talked about the importance of sleep and recovery. But then even on the very first episode of the show, just introducing what the show is going to be about, um, that was one of the things that I mentioned was like, I feel like a lot of times we are all so busy, we're pushing ourselves whether that's at home, in your family life, at work, um, school, in the gym, whatever that is. And we're like draining ourselves of sleep, but like staying up late, doing a bunch of stuff and getting four hours of sleep is kind of worn like a badge of honor. Like, it's like, that means I'm working hard. That means I'm not wasting any opportunities. But what that also means is you're not allowing your body to like get the time that it needs to recover because when we sleep is when we recover the most. So, um, yeah, I think that's like the best point that you bring up is even though it sounds like maybe that's the last piece in your recovery process that you've like started to implement, you were already lifting. I'm sure you're already doing some like stretching or maybe you were getting like a massage or something like that. Now you're focusing on the sleep and, uh, that's probably the most important part. Yeah. I mean, You've seen how limited my mobility is. I haven't done a ton of stretching. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, Gabe's not the most mobile person in the world, but when you work on things, it does improve. And I think that's one of the things that we can see is yeah. as he puts the work in, he's seeing the improvements. And then that's just going to translate. You know, I don't know if you plan to do another one of these races or not, but if you do, it should just continue to translate into your fitness events. Um, so were you, I would imagine the answer to this is yes. But lifting is a part of your routine now for a lot of runners that we get to work with. A lot of times we find that they are not really putting in much time from a lifting or resistance training standpoint. Uh, a lot of runners will say that they're doing strength training, but then in reality, what they're doing a lot of is high repetition, low weight, endurance based um, activities or, or a lot of body weight. You know, maybe that's a lot of body weight squats. And one of the things we know from the research is runners, particularly endurance athletes will benefit more from heavier strength training so that they can get the physiological effects that don't take place during the endurance based running. How long has lifting been like a part of your fitness routine? Is that something you were doing before you got into endurance running? Yeah. I mean, probably since I was, you know, 12 years old or something like that, I've been, I've been lifting. And, you know, I think because my athletic background wasn't in you know running per se Mm -hmm. i the lifting has always been has always been there and that's so that's always been a a part of it and yeah i I agree entirely about the uh um things that get branded as like strength training for runners and it's you know it's yeah just uh three sets of 10 and and do it that way with not really much intention behind it or emphasis on form or Mm -hmm. like having the uh um 
you know, progressive overload, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. And we'll probably have, you know, if it, uh, if it comes out before this episode or after this episode, we're going to have an episode on strength training on this, uh, on this podcast, talking about just the intention behind it and how you can optimize your strength training for certain activities. Um, and that's one of the things is like, you don't want to just get more and more and more of the same thing, right? Variety is good in pretty much all activities, right? A lot of the times, um, you know, we think about that in a cross training standpoint, like mixing in some, some cycling or some swimming with running, but strength training is also cross training, but it's very supplemental to the endurance work that you're doing. And, um, you know, I don't know too many people that would call themselves like a hardcore runner that really like strength training as much. Usually they like the running more and they strength train or they don't. But, but what I tell them is like, you know, strength training in and of itself is not necessarily going to automatically make you a better runner, but what it should do is assuming you're doing the strength training properly with proper form technique and some intention is it's going to buffer in the resilience to your body to be able to tolerate the demands of running better and to tolerate more running. And then you'll be able to run more and that's going to make you a better runner. Yeah. You know, if I go shoot free throws and I just keep shooting free throws and practicing them intentionally, I'll probably get better at free throws because right now I'm pretty, pretty subpar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting thing about that too. Um, the, the fun part about like the lead to 100 finish line is sitting there at 10 AM, the 30 hour mark watching, you know, people finish watching the last people finish and like people who've been out there for 30 hours who've just been grinding it out and struggling. But, um, what you'll often see is like, you'll see people hunched over because like they don't have the strength left in their, in their back or their, or whatever to, to, to hold them upright. Right. So it's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, you well, need to be doing the strength just yeah. to stand straight. At Absolutely. The, at the end of a race. And I mean, even just like, you know, thinking about that, you know, that's imagine if you were just, you know, doing this trail run or hike or run or walk, whatever it ends up being for 30 hours for a hundred miles. I mean, most of us don't even know what it would feel like to just be awake for 30 hours and be on our feet for 30 hours and the physical toll that even that would take on your body. Like imagine if you were just like in your neighborhood, just like walking around, standing up, staying on your feet for 30 hours, your body, body would be exhausted if you don't prepare it for that activity. So, um, I mean, imagining trying to do that at altitude while covering a hundred miles. Um, yeah, that's going to take an extreme toll on your body. And if you don't, you know, I would imagine everyone who is participating in these events and completing them at a high clip, like finishing them pretty efficiently relative to, to other people, I'm sure they're doing some type of strength training to build in the resilience to their tissues, to be able to withstand that. Um, so Gabe, after you do one of these events and maybe the answer is different for the Led Leadville hundred run compared to the series, but like how long, um, do you think it like sort of took your body to like kind of feel back to normal after doing something like that? Cause you know, I think a lot of people listening to this maybe have run a marathon or they've done a, a workout in their life that left them extremely sore. And, you know, after a handful of days, you generally feel back to normal, but I've not run a race of this magnitude. So like, how long did it take you to like, be able to just feel like you're basically back to baseline? Yeah. I think after, you know, the hundred bike and the 10 K, you know, I came in and saw you pretty quickly after that, mm -hmm. I, after that session, I think I was feeling, Oh, okay. Like nothing was, painful or anything like that. So I, I felt like I was in a good position reco recovery wise to do the hundred run. But after the, after the hundred run, um, you know, I, it took me 23 hours of being, nice. seeing, being out there on, on the feet for that long. I think it probably, I think it took me like two weeks before I felt like I didn't have pain in all of my joints as I was moving. Sure. And like, the day after, like the night after the night I got home trying to sleep, like it was, it was the weight of the blanket on top of me was painful. Like that's how, that's how sensitive I was, uh -huh. <laughs> was at that, at that yeah. moment. Um, but I think it, yeah, I think it took me two weeks before I started to feel less pain. And then 
I don't know. I think it probably took me, you know, to rebuild strength and to just try to feel like what I consider normal. It probably took me a couple of months. I yeah. Yeah. And, and did you say that uh, that final event, right, takes place in August yep. towards the end of August? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think I remember that week because another one of our clients, uh, Ryan, right, he was he was with you and, and sort of paced you and crewed you yep. for a part of that. Um, and I remember he came in here to the office and before I saw you, I saw Ryan and I had asked him, like, you know, how did Gabe do? How did Gabe look? How is Gabe feeling type of thing? And man, I remember him telling me, like, he feels pretty good. Like, you know, his hamstring's a little sore or something, but overall, he feels pretty good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine that it would, your joints would be sore from something like that. It would take several weeks for you to start to feel like, you're moving normal, you're more comfortable, you know, sitting in the car and whatnot, um, sleeping. Um, but I would imagine, and, you know, I think this was even true. You know, we both wrestled. I think this was true from wrestling standpoint. Um, and I think this is true for the races that you've done. Obviously they're extremely physically taxing. but I would venture to guess you would probably say the mental component of those events is even greater than the physical. Obviously you have to be prepared physically to be able to complete that without injuring yourself severely. But, um, but how, how have you felt like your development was from the mental fortitude side of things from the very first one that you signed up through now the final one that you just did this past year of like the mental toughness and strength that you've, you have to have to do something like that. Yeah, I think you, nailed it on that one, um, on it being very mental. Um, yeah, I would say every, every rate, every hundred that I've attempted and like the question of, can I finish this has popped into my mind or like, am I going to be able to finish this? Mm -hmm. Why am I doing this? It's cold. I should just call it quits right now. I'm in so much pain. There's a nice car waiting for me at this next aid station. I get some food and be done. Um, you know, that, that creeps into your mind the whole time. And, um, I think, what has changed as I've progressed and or as I've gone through this is that like, I, you know, I've pushed through those barriers so many times that I've, you know, created the, uh, the practice of, you know, more resilience and able to quickly quiet those voices that are saying like, Hey, maybe you should stop. Maybe this is too much. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think that's had a tremendous amount of, um, benefit in that arena but i think that the carryover into everyday life is even better right because it's like you're going to be tested in the same exact ways and i mean not the same exact ways but you're going to be you're going to be tested in your day-to-day -day and uh you know how how resilient are you to overcome those things is huge yeah and i love that and that was like sort of what i was going to ask you uh after you answered that question was you know how have you taken some of the things that you've learned by doing this race series and your experience over the past several years of like participating in those and being around the people that you've been around, like you got introduced to this by watching someone else push through those barriers. Like how have you taken that into your daily life, whether that's in the work, whether that's into other, other areas of your life. And you started to, to sort of say that, but like anything else come into your mind of like, how have you taken some of the things you've learned and experienced into your daily routine and daily life? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes they refer to these races as like life in a day because you kind of go through all of these different sort of things, like these these things of self doubt, these things of um, uh, adversity, and all these obstacles that you have to kind of overcome. But I would say that I I'm able to carry it um, into everyday life with the you know kind of planning, planning day day to day planning, sure. planning of life, and um, mm -hmm. I think the other. The other part too it's like i think if you could kind of force yourself to run 100 miles the little things that pop up like oh i have to work a little late is there those are those become trivial i would say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. little things get treated as as little things right <laughs> because it's, it's really not yeah. that big of a deal um no i love that because you know the more that you face obstacles and find yourself able to overcome them the easier it becomes to conquer the next one right? Like it's like a domino effect. If you can conquer this and then you can do it again. You're like, I've done this once I can do it again. I know that I can do it. And then, yeah, it just starts to help to, it sort of sounds like you're saying, put things in perspective a little bit, right? Like 
there's no sense in getting all worked up or making a big deal out of this little trivial thing, like you said, that like pales in comparison to some of the other obstacles that you've faced and made it through before. So I, I know I'm going to be able to do this, do this again. That's basically what it sounds like you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Cause I mean, you'll start to make uh, mountains out of molehills in, in during those races. And I think that happens in everyday life, but um, I think the more you get, the more you practice um, breaking those things down and, and um, putting those into their proper perspective, the better, the better you are. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and what I love is it seems like every uh, conversation that I have with somebody on this podcast, no matter what the topic is that we're talking about, is this sort of theme keeps coming up is like, it's a mindset thing that, that is how you approach, whether it's your daily life or your fitness or your family life or your work, it's the mindset. And typically speaking, the mindset of high performers is, is like just that, that like, I'm going to be able to make it through this obstacle, you know, what's the worst that could happen type of thing. Like I'm, or even if you do something and you fail, you're going to learn from the process. And, you know, it's like, it's the, all about the process. It's not necessarily about the end result type of thing. The end result is like the, the icing on top of the cake. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one quote that I really like, it's like how you do anything is how you do everything. So like the more you practice discipline, the more disciplined you're going to be um, the, in other areas, the more you practice being patient, the more patient you're going to be with your, your wife, your kids, all mm-hmm. that. but in, conversely, you know, the more you practice cutting corners, the more you're going to cut corners and, <laughs> yeah. and the more you practice uh, quitting, you're, you're going to quit. Absolutely. And I, you know, I remember that was something where um, circling back to the wrestling side of things, I think I remember when I first started wrestling and, you know, to give a little bit of a backstory here, I got talked into wrestling. Okay. You guys, I, I started wrestling my freshman year of high school and um, growing up before that, I primarily did football and running type of events, track and stuff. And that's what I was planning to do in high school. I was planning to play football, which I did. And then I was planning to run track. I wasn't necessarily planning to do a winter sport. But a friend of mine, good friend of mine, Dominic Morelli, if he ever listens to this, um, shout out to him. He was on the football team with me. We both played quarterback uh, freshman year. And we basically made a deal that uh, if I went out for wrestling, he was going to run track with me. Right. And that's how that works. So Dominic had been like wrestling for most of his life. He was really good at it. Of our four years on the high school team together, he was by far our best wrestler on the team. But so wrestling season rolls around. I go up for wrestling. But there were times early on where I was learning how to wrestle and I was getting my tail whipped by some of these older guys because I was like a decent sized freshman. I was wrestling up against a lot of juniors, sometimes seniors, and I was getting my butt whipped that I had thoughts about quitting. But we sort of had a rule in our household that like, you know, our parents weren't going to let us like start an activity and then just like quit mid season just because things got hard. I could quit after the season and like choose to not wrestle again next year. But just because I was struggling, I couldn't just like, you know, give up type of thing. And, um, you know, I think, I think that is like a huge thing that hopefully when I have a family one day that we can instill that same type of mentality, you know, you can choose to do other things, but if you say you're going to do something like do it to the best of your ability. And if the outcome's not what you want, well, so be it. You'll learn something in the process. And then to kind of wrap that story up, uh, you know, freshman year, you're 15 going on 16 type of thing. I remember uh, Dominic signed up for driver's education class uh, conveniently during the spring and he couldn't make it to track because uh, (laughs) driver's ed classes were in the afternoon. So Dominic never did run track with me in uh, in high school, but Dom's a good buddy of mine and I ended up wrestling for four years uh, anyway. So it was a it was a worthwhile trade-off in the end, even though I felt like I got talked into wrestling and he didn't hold up his end of the bargain. Um, he taught me a lot in the process. So thanks for that, Dom. Hope you and the family are doing well. Um, so Gabe, before we like start the process here of wrapping this episode up in this conversation with you, um, I, I haven't even asked you this before now, but having done these races so many times before, are, do you have plans to think about doing it again? I know you said it was several years or three or four years in between doing the series the first time, the series the second time. So now that you just did it in 2021, are you thinking about doing it again? Yeah, uh, 
plan was to go back in 2023, give myself a use this year to recover and use this, use actually, you know, use this part of this year to do, you know, an 18 month build rather than, yeah. you know, six months that I've typically done. So, and, uh, to see what I can do. I think, uh, I think there's a little meat left on the bone and mm-hmm. look forward to getting back out there and giving it a go. A little extra training I'm sure will, will, uh, pay off in the end. Well, Gabe, I want to thank you for coming on the episode on the, on the podcast rather for this episode, talking about your race experience, the, you know, just the personal growth you've had from a training and a mental standpoint. Um, so I would imagine, and maybe I'm one of these people, um, there are probably people out there who maybe hear this and they want to find out more information about the Leadville race series. And maybe they would rather ask somebody who has experience rather than just hopping online. Uh, maybe they want to talk to you more about your experience to help them potentially accomplish this, um, this in the future. Where can people get a hold of you if, uh, if they want to reach you? Um, probably the easiest would be just through Instagram. And I guess my handle is at G M Martinez, G M Martinez on Instagram. Again, this is Gabe Martinez. Everybody joining us here on the code talking about his Leadville race series experience. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode. And if you want to find out more, please go hit up Gabe right there on Instagram and we'll catch you next time on this episode of the code. Thanks so much.